The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully, you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the Ensemble team. And today I'm here with Chris Morecambe. Chris is a partner and wealth advisor at Hewison Private Wealth. Chris, great to have you here, mate. Thanks, Ben. Thanks very much. I thought a good place to start is, is really just your advice journey and how you've ended up where you are today. Sure. I suppose... I started advising back in 1997, um, but you know, I sp- part of my journey began before that, where I, you know, I graduated from university in the middle of the uh, recession we had to have. So it was a bit of a, a potted journey, um, and it was through a mentor that I got introduced to the founder of our business, John Hewison, uh, in '97. And by then, I had pretty much completed my CPA qualifications. So then, some more study to finish and qualify my certified financial planning qualifications ensued and by I think it was after two and a half years or so um, I was uh, advising and it coincided when John was chair of the Financial Planning Association so it was a, it was actually a really interesting year where he wasn't around much and I ended up taking the lead role in a lot of new clients that year and probably a bit of a baptism of fire but um, <laughs> managed to managed to not make any Major errors, but probably in, in you know learned a lot about meetings and how to get the best out of clients and and the best information for clients and probably in that first year really probably made a few mistakes in meetings that you know those clients probably wondered what on earth this young bloke was doing there. But um, I certainly um, had, you know that gave me a really strong foundation. And then a number of years, no, only probably about three or four years later, I was I became a partner in the business and um, and our our business has been built on um, a graduate mentoring program where the um, we had take on a so- graduates um, as associate advisors. We um, put them through their professional qualifications at the same time they are um, being mentored by the senior advisors in the firm. And then once they've finished their professional qual- qualifications and we deem them ready to be put in front of clients, uh, we transition some clients to them and they start um, building out their their own client base, and, and that, I was the first cab off that rank. And um, my business partners came shortly after, and and we're now on to the fourth generation of um, associates coming through. Amazing! That's uh, that's interesting that you were the the very first one, and I think it's a great way to learn. I know at Pivot Wealth we do things the same way. Each advisor's got an associate. The associate does a fair bit of the grunt work and you know when mm. they start in the early days what they're what they're able to do is less and over time they learn more and then they can do more and the advisor is obviously happy to for them to do as much as possible because it means they get to do less and spend more time you know working on clients working on strategies um uh, as well but it also means that then for the associate when they're ready uh then they're 
they're ready and and they're they're probably more advanced. And we brought a, a couple of really great senior advisors into the business, but we found that they really then have to learn, you know, the process, the approach, how we do this, what's the business view on this, and X Y Z. Whereas for the associates, it's like they know the stuff inside out because they've done it a hundred times or more by yeah. by the time they get there. So um, great, also beats you know recruiting um, as oh. well. You know, it's easier to, to bring in people that are less experienced and mold them into to what you want than, um, you, you know, finding someone that's already got that experience as well, in my experience. Chris, what does the typical client look like for you guys and for you specifically within the business? I know yeah. you guys you know, work with a range. Yeah, so well, we, we, we've got obviously a wide range um, of, of experience in, in our advice team. So... For someone like myself who's been doing this for you know 25 years our um our my, my main focus is clients with uh, investable wealth beyond a million dollars but generally speaking the clients i'm talking to probably have three million plus um that we look after um but our business our business target is for uh, targets those people those individuals and families with a million dollars investable wealth and above um or have a high income and are going to get there in a reasonable time. Um, one of the things I probably need to explain is that our practice is multi-generational. So some of the clients that we're looking after today, uh, their grandparents initially started as clients. And so we have a, a strong focus in our, in our business of making sure that when we're talking to a, an individual or a family, that we're making sure we're looking after the next generations so that when the time comes, for the transfer of wealth, um, we can help the family do that in a way that's cost efficient, tax efficient, and achieves everyone's goals and objectives, uh, but also help the family through discussions around things like, you know, if there's a significant amount of wealth, how that transfer of wealth can be done in a way that, you know, doesn't mean that little Johnny or Jenny is never never working again, but they've still got a, you know, a bit of a, a drive to do well. Interesting, no doubt. How do you, how do you practically incorporate that into conversations? Because obviously the the uh, intergenerational wealth transfer, huge opportunity out there yeah. at the moment. People retiring, going to the next generation. How, how do you guys bake it in? Yeah, look, it starts off. You know, obviously the the first first thing to do is to look after the clients who are sitting in front of you. That's the, obviously the first first thing you have to do. Um, the next thing we do is in you know we we, we ask about their children and if and and then what situation they're in and if you what know, one of the easy wins is insurance is making sure that you know if they've got you know children if your clients have got children who are early stages in a career maybe you've got a young family probably got debts in relation to their homes um clearly need insurance and making you know often most people are underinsured so usually in need of advice and we always talk to our clients from the perspective of well look if your son or daughter was to have it, you know, have something happen which meant they couldn't um, financially meet their their needs. You're probably going to be required to tip money in to help them along. You're not going to sit back and watch them flounder. So that's going to then put at risk your retirement planning. So we often talk to the parents about, well, would you like to fund the first couple of years of insurance premiums to get them going, and so they can see the benefits of it? And often the the families will share the cost of that insurance. So it's a, it's, a, it's a conversation we start right at the very start when we're talking to our clients and just making sure that, well, you know, don't forget that whatever happens to your children is probably going to impact on you. So let's let's talk about that now. And what about the wealth transfer specifically? Like how yep. obviously it's a bit of a tricky one. Like how do you, how do you guys tackle that? Yeah. Well, particularly with the significant levels of wealth, you know, sort of 15, 20 million plus, um, it's an active com- conversation because those clients are uh, it's it's one thing that is worrying them they they want to know well, how is this going to happen what's going to happen if i die who's going to get access to the money how can we protect it and so we have those it's an ongoing conversation and particularly around the estate planning and we have a lot of conversations around estate planning in that context and then then there, there'll become a point where particularly with some families what we've done is rather than the children go off and borrow money from a bank to fund their um, first home They'll borrow money, perhaps from the family trust, and there'll be a secured mortgage arrangement, and we we sort of facilitate um, that so that the the children aren't getting necessarily free money, but those and and the trust is protected in case something happens through the mortgage arrangements. It's all documented, and the lawyers are all involved in this. 
but it certainly keeps the wealth within the family rather than out to external parties. And that's an, another strategy we've used as well. The final strategy that we do use is, and it's a live one with a client at the moment, is they've got teenage children and so and they've had a they've had a sale of a business that's done better than they could have thought and they're looking at the amount of money and a comment was, well, how much is enough? And they've got way more capital than they need to meet their needs. And their concerns are, well, you know, they don't want their teenage children to know about the extent of the wealth because it, you know it's, it's certainly they're at an impressionable age and it may change the way their children think about the future so what they're what we're doing with that particular family is putting in place a um a philanthropic fund and the children are going to be involved in the management of helping manage that philanthropic fund so they'll get exposed to us and the management of the investments of that philanthropic fund without being exposed to the wider wealth of the family just to get the, the those teenagers involved in the process at an early age so that they get used to taking advice they get used to being involved in these types of discussions so when the time comes to you know i suppose come clean on the on the family wealth when they're a bit older they they'll they'll have an understanding of how the process works and, and what they need to be um this types of conversations they'll be needing to have i like it and it also i, I like the idea of shielding them from from the wealth that's um we have only, you've probably in the last couple of years started dealing with a few more clients that have the more significant levels of wealth. And uh, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that it does uh, change the way that people think about things or it has the, the risk of, yeah. of doing that also. Definitely a good strategy. You touched think, on... Just, the, yeah. Yeah. You, sorry. sorry. You go. I was just, just going to say just on that though, that, that the family, you've got to understand the fine, that family dynamics before you sort of go into that area because you've got to understand what those what the parents' thoughts are. You know, I've got one particular situation where the parent is not willing to part with any of the cash until they die. And so even though they sh- that, that person knows there's perhaps need in her children's lives for the cash, they're not going to part with it until they die. And it's an interesting day. And in the end, it's not, it's not my money, it's their money. And all you can mm. do as an advisor is point out the advantages and disadvantages of different courses of action, um, and 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 the risks associated with each. But it, that's all you can do as an advisor. You can't tell someone what to do. Mm. And there's a lot of different ways to be right there, and it's such a personal thing as well. So mm. you know, I suppose it depends on the individual and and what they think. You touched on philanthropic uh, investing there, and I know that that's a, a space that you're passionate about. How how has that all come about? Yeah, well, that goes back to the early two thousands uh, when uh, what what it, well, what used to be called prescribed private funds, but they're now um, um, PAS uh, private ancillary funds. Uh, they came into being in the early two thousands to help Australians um, keep more money. And when I first came across them, I thought there was a, a, a great degree of similarity between them and self managed super funds in terms of in terms of the requirements of, of having to manage them, I suppose, and so it was, an, and because we were dealing in the self-managed super fund sector in a big way, it just made sense to me that this is something that we could, have, we had the skill set to be able to help our clients with if they were interested in philanthropy. So I just started asking clients, um, are they are you interested in philanthropy? Straight up, and um, and and often that starts a conversation. You never know where it's going to go. Some people mm. nah, not interested. But you'll be surprised when you actually ask the question where it goes. It's uh, it's quite a fascinating um, a fascinating discussion to have with people. And so I've been able to facilitate um, people because, of course, you get a tax deduction up front for putting the money into the, this uh, into the fund. So, you know, for for a recent business client, for example, they they're getting a massive tax deduction by putting some of the capital into a private ancillary fund. So not only is it helping them help their teenage children to around the education side of things it's actually helping them on, a t- on the tax side as well um and so yeah so but i also got involved that led to things and then i ended, ended up being involved uh in the community foundation network so um in australia is quite a strong has got a quite a strong um community foundation network particularly strong in victoria actually and so i presented at a couple of their conferences conferences and got to know a few of the board members and ended up we, we are now look after a, 
about you know, six, five or six different um, community foundations here in Victoria, and that's been a really rewarding thing because you're not dealing with it, you're not dealing with sort of individuals wealth. You're actually doing community wealth and a board of directors. It's a different, it's a different way of advising because you're advising a board rather than individual and their their own wealth. So it's a, it's quite a different uh, dynamic, but it's uh, been very rewarding as well. And that. And that's sort of, I suppose, led me led us to where we are today, where we look after about twelve to fifteen different philanthropic trusts or foundations, along you know, including some private ones. I think you I feel like you're touching on some pretty sexy advice stuff there when you talk about the you know working with funds and the the directors, right. also just private clients, you eight figures plus in wealth. You know, advisors don't really start there, but I know from talking to a lot of advisors and for myself included it's like that there is uh an attraction to that sort of work how have you gone about building out the the skill set and and the tools the advice tools strategies tactics and approach to to bring on clients like that and and you know add the value that you do so that's a great question ben um when i first joined the firm our minimum client size was a hundred thousand dollars and it didn't change for a while <laughs> and and um and so we've actually got a number of clients that we look after that don't have, you know, heaps of heaps of money uh, because they're, you know, throwback to to those days. But and then like anyone who starts a business, you know, anyone who's prepared to pay your fees is a client, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so because you know you got you got to pay the bills, um, and if you don't have clients, you can't feed your family. So there's a real need in the early days to to try and get clients. But I think anyone start, particularly anyone starting out in practice today, you've actually got the um, you, you, you're, you're starting out in a period where there's an absolute um, need for advice and people with fairly significant wealth are just looking around not knowing where to turn. So I think there's a real opportunity to build a brand and build a business that look, really looks after people without having to sort of start off really small. You asked about skills. So we've always had a the mentality that our advisors must be degree qualified and they must hold the certified financial planning uh, designation. That's sort of, sort of been our our stake in the ground. And look, I think it it just creates a a minimum standard that we expect from people. So it's and it and it's you know there's obviously that that's morphed and changed over the last twenty five years. That in terms of what what you need to do to become a CFP and and mm. continue to hold it. But in the end, it does you, you're just putting that that shingle up that says, well, I've done all the study. I know what I'm talking about. We are independent. We always have been. So we even do insurance on a fee for service basis. Um, so that that in itself is an attraction for high high net worth families and individuals because they are looking for bespoke outcomes and um, and the idea of independence is is attractive to them. I would suggest though that anyone planning to do that needs to think click, click carefully about the structuring of their business because I think one of the challenges of running a bespoke investment business is that you can drown in the paperwork mm-hmm. and and and, um, and so that's been a it's an ongoing challenge for our business you know scaling a business of our size uh, and re- keep maintaining that bespoke model um, is not without its challenges and um, and I you know we're always looking for ways to to be more efficient yet still provide our clients with that bespoke model um, of outcomes. And I suppose the final point I'd make is that we've always we've always focused on continuing development. With uh, John was heavily involved with the Financial Planning Association. I sat on the Financial Planning Education Council for about eight years. Uh, we, you know, education and continuing development of our people is is so important, and we we just don't stop. And so that's the I suppose the fight. You know, the other part to it, and that's not just technical skills. It's also you know your interpersonal skills, your building trust, the um, marketing, sales, training, all of that. It, it, it's a it, you just got to keep working on it because you've n- you never know it all. Mm, absolutely, and and in my experience, I've found that the the technical piece, obviously, that's your ticket to the game, but it's it's yeah. probably all the other things that are as important, if not more. Like obviously, you can't get it wrong on the technical stuff, but as you can get it right, that's nowhere near enough. Like it's such a small small part of what it takes to be a great advisor and get great outcomes for your clients as well. But I, I, I agree with you. 
agree with you, yeah. Ben, but I think the other thing too is just to know when you don't know. So mm. you, you've also got to be really comfortable in you know working closely with other professionals, such as solicitors and accountants, to to give your client the absolute best outcome and know that you know. Okay, I know that I, I know I know about say for example small business capital gains tax relief I know about it but I'm never going to advise someone about it because it's so complex mm. and so um, you know but as an advisor you, you recognize it you talk to your clients about it and say look let's work with your accountant on on making this happen in, a, in the best way possible and being really open and having an open relationship with those other professionals they value you then and then next thing you know they're referring clients to you and, and mm. And that works really well. And that's and our our business was built on referrals from other professionals. I think you've touched on an interesting point there through both of those comments that I think regardless of exactly what your ideal client looks like and what your what your core offering is for those clients, I think that really the key challenge for advice firms as they do scale is to create consistency of approach so that, you know, we know that every advisor is going to be different. You know, the jokes are a little bit different. Their take on, you know, markets, you know, broadly aligned, but a little bit different, nuanced as well. I know for us that one of the things that, and our clients are generally, you know, high income wealth accumulators, not necessarily with a million dollars of investable assets, but they're certainly on a path to getting there, although they would have their Wesnet over a million dollars mm. in debt assets. Um, mm. And one of our challenges has been how do we create that consistent experience where we know that all advisors are going to be considering the same levers to, to get a client to where they want to be and guiding the clients in the similar way so that if you put 10 clients in the same position with the same thinking around a you know risk or mm-hmm. investing or debt or whatever through the process that you would get to 10 pretty similar outcomes and i think that's something that's really important to from a, from a mm-hmm. business perspective in terms of your your business risk but also from a team perspective in that knowing what what you do from your you know selling people into to to what you're doing and making sure that you're delivering on those promises how have you guys tackled that in the space that you're in? Yeah, well, we've got a we've got a very deliberate process, um, as you would expect. Uh, so we uh, go back a step. Um, every every year we have a, um, a staff conference. We close the office for two days, take the staff off site somewhere nice, and we review aspects of the business. Um, and and each conference has a different focus. So one you know one year it might be on personal development of the staff and, and you know communication. Another one might be looking at our systems and processes. Another one might be market. Whatever aspect is the big issue for that year, that's what we we focus on. And we used to actually have two a year back in the day, which was um, you know quite extraordinary, but it did drive a lot of uh, innovation and change in the business. And um, the one thing we worked on some years ago was documenting our, the process that a client goes through from the day they first contact our business to the day they are, are, are an ongoing client. And and that was a really challenging and interesting thing because you know once you've gone through that process, you can see and you've documented, you can see where things can be improved. But once you've got a standardized process and everyone agrees that that's the process, then all the, every client gets the same sort of experience. And then what we've done um, around the advice side is prior to advice being written, uh, particularly for a new client, but it may be a significant change in circumstances as well. Um, I, we what we call the workshops, and and the generally the associate advisor will present the client scenario to at least two of the senior advice senior advisors and as many of the associates who are available, and basically put up a snapshot of the client where they are today, who they are, talk through. You know a bit of the details about that client, what their objectives are, uh, what the recommended strategy is going to be, uh, it right down to even a proposed asset allocation for the investments, and then um, and then the floor's open. And as a result of that, you're getting the best ideas of everyone rather than just that advisor. And it also is a great training tool for those associates to get to hear the advisors talk about things like. Well, do you think that's enough money to set up a self-managed super fund? Or what's the strategy? What strategy are you doing around debt there? Or have you thought about philanthropy in that 
cut in this in how we have you discussed the philanthropy with these clients and so it's all and and it just gives you that opportunity to have an open discussion it's 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 not a there's no egos in the room and it's just about what's the best thing for these clients and it um and the asset allocations critiqued as well you know you told us these clients are a bit concerned about volatility yet you've got you know 60 percent of the money in in or seventy percent of the money in exposed to markets, is it, do you feel comfortable that that's appropriate to achieving their goals and objectives? So that they're the sorts of conversations that, that are had in that in those workshops, and it, we found that to be hugely valuable. I love that, and I I can see that particularly for pulling in the associates, getting good exposure to lots of clients as opposed to just the ones that they're working with would be super yeah. valuable for the advisors. Is it? A different advisor than the the advisor that's actually the lead advisor for the clients, or yeah, is it like yeah. the last one? Yeah, yeah. No, we we try and try and get as many in the room as we can. So, um, and and the, and the and the reason for that is that that more heads are going to make a better decision in this case. So, particularly, um, it's often if it's a simple if it's a simple sort of situation, and there's not much contentious sort of. There's going to be um, an agreement pretty much on what the strategy is going to be. Then you you don't have to go into a lot of detail. But particularly when you're dealing with clients of the size we're dealing with, there's always going to be something that's you know sitting there. It might be that the completely overweight property and and talking through a strategy to perhaps uh, reweight their overall wealth to to be less focused on property or or what have you. So it's a, it's just talking through those things. Often there's a business sale, and so talking through well what what are the issues around that business sale and has has the funding been thought of and is it vendor finance is it you know what's what's the sale mechanism so those types of things also discussed i love that definitely uh just writing some notes here, here as we hey, yeah, yeah. we'll have to be able to use that and it's, yeah and it's just a simple like that we don't over complicate it we've just we've created a um a standard template in, in excel that's got you know the names of the client, the ages, uh, the family situation, what income they earn, what their estate planning arrangements are, what insurance arrangements they've got in place, a summary of their current asset position and debt position, and then, as I said, a quick snapshot of their goals, their um, what, and then what suggested strategy. So we're not we're not asking the group to come up with a strategy. The advisor and the associate who are presenting this workshop actually have to do the work prior to the workshop and say, well, this is the strategy we're going to do in this is sort of roughly the 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 structure in which we're looking at it. And then it might be a simple one minute, you know, one or two minutes meeting where we quickly go through the client scenario and then everyone says, yep, that, that looks right. Nothing to add. Off we go. It's a great way to just make sure everyone's keeping an eye on, I suppose, the, you know, the strategies we're doing from a responsible manager perspective, which is what I'm one of our responsible managers, I take great comfort that we're documenting in that spreadsheet mm. the alternative strategies. So, yeah, so, so, so if we're, if, for example, if we're setting up self managed super fund, the alternative strategy might be retain the existing one, use an industry fund, use a retail fund, and, and the reasons why they're not appropriate in that circumstance. And I imagine that then from that meeting, it would be fairly efficient for the, for the associate with the advisor to then you know, put together the strategy to lay it all out and yeah. ultimately yeah. provide the advice to clients as well. So got that on yeah. on a bunch of levels. Yeah, Chris, absolutely. Changing changing gears a little bit. Um, sure. look, looking forward, what's um what's coming up for you guys? What are you focused on at the moment? Yeah, so we're firmly focused on, um, I suppose, two things. One's growth and one's innovation. So, um, in terms of growth, we've got um. A huge we've got a, quite a number of associates coming through so we need to keep growing the business so that there's going to be clients for them to manage when they become advisors a key focus of ours is to keep growing the business to so that we can keep giving our people opportunities uh, so that's, that's sort of one thing the other uh, and, and innovation is probably the other major one and that is we've changed our tech stack over the last five or six years well actually it was mid 2010s we recognized that the technology we we're using at the time which was a bespoke system that we had developed over 30 years had come to the end of its useful life and that new technologies had come into the market that meant that you know for example our old system didn't play well with the internet uh, and remote working and so we uh, on the back of Andrew and um, and Simon and a few others doing innovation tours with with the Macquarie Van group they 
came together and devised a, a tech stack with taking best of breed uh, off the shelf programs and then um, making sure that they met with our needs. And so that's an ongoing investment and process where we now have turned off effectively the old system and we're now fully operational in new systems and now starting to enhance those new systems to be um, more closely aligned to the service delivery that we want and make sure that our internal processes are, are efficient. So there's a huge amount of work to be done on that this year to probably capitalize on all the work that's been done over the last three to five years. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a never ending one as well with the tech stack. I know we just changed our core CRM a bit over twelve months ago, and not dissimilar to what you were saying that it's like you you've got to do all that work to get it happening. But then once you do, it's like okay, well now now what? And there's so 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 much potential out there, but there's yeah. also you know so much time that goes into doing it, and uh, you know yeah. trying to figure out that works for all the people in the business, all the clients and yeah. the app that you want as well. Yeah. I think the thing for us was that we, like we've moved to Salesforce as the CRM, for example, and that is one of the most powerful tools. Like it's, there's so much to it and you can't begin to um, know it all right from the very mm-hmm. start. And it's only through, uh, as you sort of get more comfortable and you start to look at the data points you've got that you can build together amazing dashboards to help manage your clients more efficiently and you know we we're just talking last week about new dashboards for the for the advice team um and uh, you know making sure that the key information is just at your fingertips all the time and that that's just you know it's just gold the way the way it's so available mm. absolutely yeah it's unlimited it's in fact it's borderline overwhelming how much you can do <laughs> but the challenge is like what's going to move the dial the most and you know what can what can we roll out or well, what's the right thing to to roll out next so uh, i feel you on that one chris my last question for you is if you could you've been in your business 25 years uh if you could go back to your day one self and and do one thing differently what would it be oh don't be as tentative um i i probably underestimated the value that i bring to people what the, the reason I love what I do and the reason I keep doing it is because I like to help people and and financial planning is a wonderful juncture of the business side of stuff which I enjoy enjoy and the you know the the financial metrics and all that that's 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 interesting and you know but just doing that without having any impact on someone would be boring yeah. but at the other and and the other side of the coin is just helping people but not the financial stuff and I and that's what my wife does as a financial counselor and I Hats off to financial counsellors. Oh, there's no way I could do that either because it's it's just all all consuming. But you, it's just mm-hmm. you know it's pretty hard work. So we're really, really, really lucky as financial planners is that we get to marry the two and we get to utilise our skills to get people in a better situation and help them and you know reach their goals and dreams. And for me, that's there's nothing better. And so. So that's right. Back yourself more earlier, so you can do more of yeah, that. So, so, so yeah. So just backing myself earlier. So you know, being more confident in in my skills and abilities, and perhaps not being as shy about what we can do for people. Because, and, and I purposely use the word we because there's no way I can do it all. It's uh, you know we've got a whole team of people that mean we can do what we can do, and I think that's that that's that's the really empowering part of it all. I love it. I think it's um it's really easy when you sometimes get too close to it that you're focused on oh we're helping people with this strategy or this technical piece. But sometimes when you take a step back and go well what is the value and what are we doing you you see that it you know it does change people's lives and uh, I know yeah. for me as as I feel privileged to do that every day. Uh, it's yeah. um yeah uh, we've all got this. Great. Look every 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 advisor who's been doing it for five years plus knows has a story in their back pocket of a particular situation where they know that the individual or family would have just been in an absolute mess without the advisor's help and assistance. And I just think that that's the sort of thing that you, as advisors, need. As advisors, we need to make sure that we're talking about the, that value as uh, uh, with each other and with, with the greater public because that's what will drive people to seek out advice. Because there's going to be fee pressure. People are going to talk about fees all the time. But unless as a profession we're talking to people about the good we do, no one will actually hear about it. They'll only hear the bad news stories. 
That's right. Yeah. And and pay the opportunity cost of not doing all the things. And it's it's funny, obviously we are conflicted yeah. when you talk to someone about getting advice that we want them to get advice because they're going to be a client and you know there's a commercial yeah. outcome that attached to that for us. But at the end of the day, we also know that in the absence of advice, it's like they're going to keep making the same mistakes and uh, yeah. you know, paying the price that, that comes with that. So uh, yeah, I think the more that we can highlight that stuff, the the more confidence people get in advice and, you know, we're all better for it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Chris, thank you so much, mate. Really appreciate you sharing your story and insights. Um, so much, so, so I've got a page of notes here, so mate, I really appreciate it. No worries, Ben. Um, happy, happy to be part of this and thanks for uh, the opportunity to have a chat. Cheers, guys. We'll catch you next time.